welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today is author Tim Egan. We're taping the show at the Women's University Club in Seattle before a live audience. Tim, thanks so much for being here today to talk about this book and your earlier books. And you know, I'm just happy to be here as your supporting act. So. <laughs> oh, Tim, <laughs> shucks. Um, so before we talk about this book in particular, I'd really like to know, one of the things I've always wanted to ask you is how you choose your subjects. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's, there's a, a sort of a common theme, but at the same time, they're very diverse. It's interesting, I realize now, as other people have pointed out to me, I've spent with the last three books, you know, a lot of time in about a 30 year period. <laughs> From 1900 to 1930, if you mid 30s, if you go through the Dust Bowl, the fire happened in the start of the 20th century. The Curtis epic starts in 1900 when he decides to go launch this masterpiece, this odyssey that will take him most of his life, and ends in 1930. So, that's purely accidental. I didn't plot. Oh, I'm going to do three books that all happen in a 30-year <laughs> period. I follow story. Uh, I am a storyteller. It's in the Irish DNA. And so I am looking for story. I am looking for drama, collision, values. Uh, and in the Curtis story, so many things are going on. Two worlds collide. That old, the native world, which is literally being erased from this city and from most of the West at a time that the cities are all ascendant. Um, the discovery of what photography can be as an art. The discovery of what photography can do to preserve cultures. And at the core of it is a single human being who has who lives 10 lives in the course of his own life and, and does change history. At the end of the book, I say he not only saw history, he made history. All of this with a sixth grade education. I don't plan these things. I don't plot out, hmm, how can I find a guy like that uh, who's one part Indiana Jones, you know, one part, uh, he was the Annie Leibovitz of his day when he was the premier portrait photographer. I, I have these ideas and they sort of, you know, marinate, um, I guess to use a, a food term. And, and then you, know, you start to do some research, and with the research, you see the story arcs. And so I've always got about three or four things going and where I'm thinking of, does this make a book, does this make a book? And then when I see story arcs, in the case of Curtis, um, I started reading the letters at the University of Washington with his longtime friend, Ed Meany, where he poured his heart out to him. Meany alone believed in Curtis through this great artistic journey he went on. It was to Meany that Curtis would write after he had lunch with President Roosevelt, just giddy. Do you know who I just had lunch with the president? And that's who he would, it was meaning when Curtis thought that, you know, he'd lost everything and they'd, life would, you know, posterity would not be good to him. And Meany said, no, you know, you, you will soon die, but time will be good to you. So when I saw these letters, I started to see it. So it, Nancy, it's not a, you know, I, I, I'm looking for story. And so I, I let these things sort of go. In the Dust Bowl's case, I found some really good story arcs, some people who'd seen the whole of life from the grassland being just the open prairie to the destruction to just dying a few years ago. When you're thinking about that, or you're thinking about Teddy Roosevelt, who appears in, in mm -hmm. the last yeah. two right. of the books, do you think that you would ever want to focus in on, I mean, he's so endlessly interesting. Roosevelt, I mean, let me just back up on Curtis and Roosevelt sure. for one second, because <clears throat> it's important to understand how far Curtis went in such a short amount of time. When he takes his per first picture of a native, which is Princess Angeline, Chief Seattle's daughter, in a city that will soon be the largest city in the world named for a Native American, having passed an ordinance making it illegal for an Indian to live within the city limits. Curtis is this man in full. He's sort of a stud, he's a good looking guy. I think he looks like Brad Pitt. And that's why I want to play him in the movie, by the way. So. <laughs> And he's six foot two, and these, these, these character descriptions I'm always talk about his dreamy eyes. And you know, he's a good looking, confident person, but he has a sixth grade education. He had been doing what Angeline had been doing. He'd been picking berries at his little homestead across the way in Puget Sound. He'd been splitting wood. He'd been digging clams and selling them. He lived a subsistence lifestyle a few years before he's taking the picture of Angeline, the subsistence Indian. Five years after that, he's dining at Roosevelt's summer White House. So it's, it's important to understand in 10 years' time how far he has come. Now, the Roosevelt thing that interested me was that Roosevelt is best known for being the man who set aside our public lands, our national parks, the person who discovered that so much of authentic America was, would be gone if we didn't do something about it. But it didn't extend to Native people. 
he never had much nice to say about Indians. And in fact, in his books he wrote on the West, the winning of the West, Indians were always dismissed. He, off, he said, I don't necessarily believe that every good Indian is a dead one, but I'm pretty close to it. Curtis helped to persuade him at the time when Roosevelt was in his setting aside of national monuments that the people themselves had equal claim on preservation, authenticity, do something about them. It was against the law for most of these cultures. The pictures, the most iconic pictures that Curtis took of the sun dance, of the snake dance, uh, the rituals that these people have been practicing for centuries were illegal. They were felonies under the Religious Crimes Code Act. Think about this. The First Amendment allows you freedom of worship, any god of your choice, unless you were Native American, and there was a felony to do that. So Roosevelt comes around, largely through the summer that Curtis spends while he's president and the most popular American in the world. Here's Ed Curtis of Seattle shooting pictures of his kids, hanging around, showing up at dinner at the Summer White House. And all the while he's showing these pictures. Here's Chief Joseph. Do you know who he was? Here's you know, all these people. And he's saying, look at these cultures. And Roosevelt is preserving you know, these national monuments, but they don't include people. Yeah. So I think he brought him around on that. And that's what fascinated. You don't see that in any of the Roosevelt biographies. Yeah, you don't. There's right. A... So it's a little part of his character. If, I, if you allow me one small asterisk on this. That summer, Curtis took a picture of Teddy Roosevelt. The light is wonderful on his face, and he's not the big square-jawed Teddy. He's a contemplative, thoughtful, readerly Teddy. Roosevelt said it was the best picture anyone ever took of him. He used it in his autobiography as the frontispiece. And if you go down to Seattle's Rainier Club, where Curtis spent his last 10 years in Seattle, basically paying his rent by giving up his masterpieces, there hangs the Teddy Roosevelt picture in the hallway. Wow. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a... When Curtis took it, he knew it was brilliant. You talked about um, the the Cobb building on um, on. Could you talk talk about that just because that's so interesting? It's interesting to look at where Curtis is one of the most famous ghosts of Seattle, um, and this ghost has left left his trail around here. I can't walk these streets anymore without seeing his presence. But one of the real physical living legacies of Edward Curtis right now is if you go down to Fourth and University where he had his last studio and you look up at the Cobb building and you'll see these terracotta Indian figures looking down. They're very majestic. That's an homage to the great Ed Curtis whose last studio was on Fourth and University. Now, again, it's important to understand how famous he was before he disappeared into the mists of time. When you came to Seattle, one of the most important things you had to do was go to the Curtis studio. It, that's where he made most of his money, was selling his prints. It was like going to the Chihuly studio now at the Seattle Center. How did your research, so you, you get this kind of nubbin of a, of an, a story arc, right. and then you start researching it. Are there, are there many ideas that you've had to just sort of put aside because the research didn't support? You know, I go in fairly open-minded. I want to have a grand story. Mm -hmm. I want to have all the things that you have in a great novel. I'm different than a lot of nonfiction writers, although I think Eric Larson is certainly like this, our fellow Seattleite. I do two things. I, I really research like crazy and obsess on all the papers, everything you can get the first hand. There's a lot in Library of Congress too. But I also go to all the places he went to. I want to be able to describe what the wind is like at five o'clock. I want to be able to describe Alpen Glow on the Canyon de Shade, why that light so captured Curtis, later captured John Ford, and Ansel Adams, he preceded both of them in understanding the light of the Southwest on, on some of those flanks. Why Curtis was obsessed with Mount Rainier, he could have just gone into history as the, one of the premier mountaineers of young Seattle, having put more women on the summit than any person had ever done before. They had to wear bloomers, by the way, which is a requirement <laughs> of the Mazama Climbing Club. Um, so, you know, I go to the places where he went. I want to understand the physical as well as the interior life. Now, you're disappointed at some things, and in Curtis, my biggest disappointment was I couldn't get in to the mind of his wife. They had a very bitter divorce. They were madly in love early on. If I could just tell a story about how Curtis, he, he's blue collar. His father, his sickly preacher father, dies when they move to Puget Sound. So he's raising his widowed mother and four kids, basically, and he has a terrible accident. He spends almost a year on his back as a 21-year-old, and it's where he starts to look at the world in an observational way. He's where he just talks later in his old age when he was describing how he became an artist, how he looked at a, a tiny raindrop on a rhododendron leaf and how that could hold the prisms of light. So he becomes an observer. He also falls in love with the 17-year-old girl who becomes his wife. She's his partner. She's the one who all these years says, you're going to be someone. You're, you don't have to shoot pictures of all these debutantes. She's the one who keeps him going. They have a terrible, terrible ongoing breakup. 
Now, I wanted to know what was, what was going on inside of a marriage. The great thing you always hear is no one knows anyone right. else's marriage. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I found this in the divorce files, which I leafed through all the files at King County. Mrs. Curtis, Clara Curtis, during this bitter divorce, burned entire treasure trove of letters from her husband. So I got the letters from his best friend, but I didn't get the letters to her. Mm -hmm. oh. So I was looking for that part of the story. You asked me what I'm looking right. for. I really right. wanted that. When you're doing the research is like the first place you start. I, I, you know, University of Washington has a fabulous, they really do. fabulous collection of on, on almost any subject that you would right. want. They have something maybe rivaling only Texas, um, the, the Harry Ransom Center there. Mm -hmm. But is, is that where you start? Well, in this book I did, the University mm -hmm. of Washington Special Collections would be. Is, a, is, is just, you know, it's the Vatican. Mm -hmm. They, by the way, I want people to understand, in this magnum opus, 30 years that Curtis spends, he's doing 20 volumes called The North American Indian. When it's done, it is compared to the largest single change in bookmaking since the King James Bible. It's compared to John James Audubon's Birds of America. It, it is, it go, no matter what you ever think of Curtis or what, how he posed or anything like that, that singular achievement is one of the greatest, tradition, greatest achievements right. of anyone who's ever put together books. Now, how many, each one of those is a set. You know how many of those sets were produced? Less than 300. And it, they sold for $3,000 at the time. Now they've sold for as much as $2 million now at auction. So the University of Washington has a set. The Seattle Public Library has a set, although it's been vandalized and lost three of the volumes. Um, the Bullet family has a set. So I know of at least three that exist in this. And they're, they're these things that sort of you know, like antique roadshow pop up here and there all over the world. Some of us, uh, King George of England had a set. The Kaiser of Germany had a set. The Vatican had a set. So these things, are, there are only 227 of them. They sort of float around. And you know, the story is, is great, great from a storytelling perspective. Curtis finishes the project in 1930, after 30 years. And he's lost his copyright to J.P. Morgan, his benefactor, because he's so broke. And he's, Morgan keeps lending him money. Finally, he's 2.5 million into this guy, Curtis. And he gives him his copyright. So Morgan then dies, and they sell the, what's left of the treasure trove, 15 of the, 50 of the sets, the copper plates, all the drawings, all the writings. You know, he did transcribe, he recorded songs, more than 10,000 languages for 1,000 bucks to a Boston bookseller. And it sits, that bookseller dies a year later. His name is Laureate. It sits in the basement for almost 40 years. It's not discovered until the 1970s. So I was interested in the the story after the story as well. Right. You know. And Laureate, the bookseller, went on to, I mean, there was a whole chain in the Northeast of Laureate bookstores. Exactly. Yeah. So. And individual Curtis pictures sell for $250,000, some of the mental. Now, I don't want to dwell on the money part of it because I think it was a fantastic, I think it was a masterpiece. I really do. I think what Edward Curtis of Seattle did was arguably the greatest artistic masterpiece that anyone from this city has ever done. Oh, yeah, I think. Well, I'm I, glad to hear you. No, no, I mean, I, I mean I'm trying to <laughs> We're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Chihuly or yeah, somebody's so, going to come yeah. after us. Oh, but, uh, right. we no, but we're going to get in trouble here. when somebody hears this. But I, I'm glad to hear you say it because just in terms of scope and, and what it means to Native people now, those are, the, those are the critics I go to who appreciate him for having captured their humanity. And, and whether they were posed or not in that whole sort of controversy about how posed were they and all of that, all that aside, it's still a, it's still a picture of a vanished past and vanishing past. And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, Nancy. The, the posing question, I think, is a bogus argument because those are people in the modern day looking at these now. They don't realize that if you read the interviews with Curtis that were contemporaneous, he never ever denied posing. He paid his subjects. He always paid his subjects. He would spend months and months and months researching a tribe, getting to know the people before he would take their picture. And then he would say, and what do you want to wear? Do you, want to, do you have your head bonnet that your grandfather had? Do you want to put that on? Now, by the time he gets to Oklahoma, you'll see at the end of the book, when he gets to the once mighty Comanche, Lords of the Plains, this, this is probably the most fearsome Indian tribe that this continent had ever seen. They're diminished and vanquished and living on this postage stamp Reservation. What does he shoot a picture of? A guy in a dress shirt and a tie and short hair. So you know he he wanted to reflect the glory and the authenticity of a past that was being dis was was being erased. I think we also ascribe maybe wrongly 
that, that we sort of think that those pictures are romanticized. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm not sure that I would, that's not the term I would use. Certainly with the portraits, I wouldn't say that. If you look into the portraits, Geronimo, I'll give you an example. There were three famous Native Americans who he shot. Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce, who's brought to Seattle in 1903 to attend a Husky game. And he goes up to one, and they think it's a really great thing to see an Indian watching a football game. They ask him what he thought, and he said, I saw a lot of white men almost hurt each other. <laughs> and, and Curtis alone knows that the tragedy of Joseph and his people, he's lost his homeland in the Wallawa Valley of Northeast Oregon. He's living on this terrible little Scabland reservation in central Washington with people who aren't even his. And he knows, it's, Curtis takes him to his studio that weekend of the Husky game, I have a whole chapter on this. And, and the picture that he takes, I don't see how anyone could ever say that's a romanticized version. It's, it's a picture for the ages. It's a picture that looks past everything that's been done to this man. Geronimo, the day he shoots his picture, he's just been paraded around Pennsylvania Avenue for Teddy Roosevelt's inauguration with the big headdress on. Curtis shoots Geronimo in a U.S. Army woolen scratchy blanket because what did the U.S. government give Geronimo when he surrendered the last native that was resisting the conquering Americans, an army blanket. Anyone who could say that's romanticized. That's why I think the portraits themselves are, are authentic in capturing the feeling. Do, do you think your, your desire to go to those places, your insistence, maybe mm -hmm. that's a better word, on going to all the places that kind of had an impact on, on the character, the people you're writing about, that comes out of your journalistic background, don't you think? Absolutely, and I could not have understood the Hopi, for example, without going to the mesas where they live. They still are on these rock mesas on the Akama, which is the oldest continuously inhabited community in the United States. People say now, St. Augustine, Florida, that's not true. People have been living atop this rock of Akama, east of Albuquerque, for a thousand years, and no one disagrees. Until you walk up to that rock, you don't understand the meaning of that community. And that does come out of my journalism. And it's, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about academics who do all the research in a bubble and don't go to the place. I don't certainly criticize it, but I think you have to get the full feel and texture. So you're very interested in politics, mm -hmm. and your wife is very interested in politics. So do, do you guys talk about anything else but politics? <laughs> <laughs> Food, sports. <laughs> yeah. you know, no, we, we get the political discussions over with fairly quickly. Uh, what do you know that's new? What do you know that's new? I mean, I know her view. She knows my view. We don't have to talk about it. You know, we're good Seattle omnivores. We, we care about a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it can be, it is interesting just to sort of swap notes and stuff, though. Yeah, because... Uh, She's more interested in the local, I'm more interested in, in the, the national. national. Yeah. Was your goal as a journalism student at UW to write for the New York Times? You know, it's been a dream, and I still have to pinch myself that I write for the New York Times from my hometown of Seattle. Uh, my grandmother died at the age of 97, just a few blocks from the Pike Place Market, living in a little apartment with a view of the ferries going away. You know, and so I really feel attachment to this place, much as you can feel attachment to any place in the West, mm -hmm. given that the cities are no more than a century old, et cetera. Um, and it's been a lifelong thing to try to stay here and keep a Western perspective. Now, when I left the national desk, I went to the opinion side, and I'm really the only opinion writer on the New York Times who lives outside of the Hudson River bubble. And I, again, I have to pinch myself that they let me do it. Um, four years and running now, so. I have to just talk about, um the book about the depression because it, I always go back to that having lived in Oklahoma for so long right. and having it so meaningful. And I think actually the Oklahoma, the uh, Tulsa City County Library had a Curtis collection. Did they really? As well, I believe yeah, they did. Because he sold them to libraries, yeah. and institutions, universities, and then rich people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And of course, in Tulsa, there's also the Gilcrease Museum mm -hmm. of, of Western Art, right. which is really splendid. How did you get the idea to do that that Depression book, which won the national? That, well, that, and if I could just give a school. plug, um, Ken Burns did a marvelous documentary, which will be running um, later this month, um, called The Dust Bowl. And I worked with him quite a bit. I'm his featured historian. It was great oh, to see him. Oh, that's great to know. It, and it, it's it's wow. beautiful. It's, it'll make you cry, hopefully. It's four hours on PBS. And, um, you know, what I feel so good about on that, when I finished that Dust Bowl book, I looked at my kids' high school history book, my son's American AP history, and I went to the back. Dust Bowl was like one paragraph. That's all this biggest environmental catastrophe of our time got. And so I didn't think anyone was going to read that book. 
I thought, I'm going to have such a hard time finding an audience. To my shock, it found a huge audience. And now through Ken Burns' film, it'll go global. This story will never be forgotten. And I was largely the person who was handed the story from the survivors. I felt like I was the living, you know, there's a little baton being handed off like in a race, that they were handing their story off to me. Uh, you know, all I did was walk around all over the Dust Bowl region, go from town to town, trying to find people who had some living memory of this thing. And they hadn't spoken of it for 50 years. I'm the last person that's going to write the Dust Bowl story. You know, I'm, uh, I don't even like the area, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, no, it, it, I it, suffer it, it, from it, brown shock when right. I'm down there, the yeah. high plains. Now I'm going to get some letters from Texas if somebody sees this, unfortunately, because I love the people. Let me put it that way. Uh, terrain, weather, not so good. Um, but no, I, I sort of became the accidental person in that regard. And, and it was, again, it was just like this approach. I wanted to talk to living people who were still there, feel what, get a sense of why the wind would drive someone to insanity. Right. Absolutely, yes. which is what it did for, yes. in some cases. Yeah. But where did that idea come from to even begin that? Can you well, identify things yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, I was working on a piece for the New York Times about the death of small town America on the high plains. Oh. And one of the interesting historical notes, most people don't know this, is that there are fewer people living now in two-thirds of the counties of the western high plains than there were 100 years ago. It's basically frontier as the census classifies frontier, less than three people per square mile. So I was going from town to town, getting the sad story of, uh, oh, the banks left, the schools left, there's nobody left in this town but old people. And that's really what it was. It was a repetition of the story after a while. I just, you know, heard the same thing. And, and I would hear the same, but that's not the story of this place. This, what happened? What do you mean? The story is what happened during the dirty 30s. And here's, here was my light goes off moment. Steinbeck got the first take on the Dust Bowl. And in his take, everyone moves to California. It's the Jode family, it's Henry Fonda. Now this is the way culture is, Nancy, you know this. I know. If you get a great big book on something, that becomes the narrative. But two thirds of the people living in the most hard hit, you know, just serrated part of America, a place where the earth itself turned on them at a time when there's 25% unemployment, when there's no social security, they didn't go anywhere. So I then asked the question, did we maybe miss the story and what was it like to live through that? And Ken mm -hmm. explores that in his Dust Bowl. It's hardly at all about you know, going to California. Right. So Steinbeck got his take on it. And every storyteller lives to tell a story, to use the cliche, the, the untold story. And I literally felt I was telling an untold story with this wonderful thing, they're living people. They saw the whole damn thing. They yeah. saw the grassland. They, and this girl told me she got up on her, just woman, she was 99. She got up on her tippy toes <laughs> at the age, I would look at her and I could see a 17 year old. She's described coming in on a horse drawn wagon in Oklahoma and getting up on her tippy toes to look over the grass and th thinking how beautiful it was. She died three years ago. So she saw everything. Well, I was struck when I read The Worst Hard Time, the way you explained what caused the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the science that went into that, that it was really man-made. It wasn't, in many ways, it wasn't nature. It certainly was man-made. Yeah. And that's the accepted um, scholarly wisdom on it now. Um, it, it was a man-caused disaster. Here's why. The wind always blows in the Southern Plains. <laughs> Believe me, having been down there and, and suffered and through it quite a bit, droughts are frequent. They're having a drought, we're just finishing a drought now, it was the worst drought in 70 years. They cut open tree rings that they find in the draws of like Palo Duro Canyon in the Texas Panhandle and they'll, a thousand year old tree and they'll say, God, there was a terrible drought 400 years ago, three, they can tell. It's not like the 1930s drought was anything they hadn't experienced. Right. It wasn't like the winds blew any harder. One thing was missing, the grass. They had torn up this highly evolved ecosystem that took eons to evolve and to develop itself. And I quote this, half Apache, half Anglo rancher in the book who tells his son the story. He looks out at the brown earth and the blowing, tumbling everything and the death and chaos that's visited the land and he says, wrong side up. And that in those three words is the story of the Dust Bowl. So can you share, like, what are you thinking about for your next book or is it, you must think about the next book yeah. even as you're out. Curtis the sequel, no. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Curtis. Right, Mrs. Curtis, the untold you story. You can do a there novel. You go. Right. Right. <laughs> what really happened, my right. side of the story, Mrs. Curtis. <laughs> you know, because the Curtis story is so terrific. I just hope, let me just say one thing on him and I'll go to that. I hope, he was somewhat of a lost Seattleite. Again, he was more famous than Bill Gates is now or any Seattleite you can think of who's popular, some member of Pearl Jam or something like that. Or it's, you know, 
A Rod before he became bad. Right. Um, <laughs> before he went bad. <laughs> right, right. Um, Curtis was a household name. And when he would arrive in Washington, D.C., the Washington Post put him on page one. Famous photographer who dined with Taft. You know, he was, he was incredibly famous. And when he came back to Seattle, they did big spreads on Curtis back in town. So, and then to just disappear into the right. mist of time, which is extraordinary considering what he did. So really what I wanted to do with this book was, A, tell this great story, but resurrect this wonderful life. This search, this artist's search for achievement, you know, portrait of an artist, portrait of a struggling human being. It's kind of a tragedy in some ways too, don't you think? Yes, I do. As it, um, I do. As it ends up. And, um, and, and so I would hazard a guess that it's not only that he was this, this great artist with this tragic end, but he was a Northwest artist. Yes. And, he's, and that's so important to you. Right. It is. It really is. I mean, I don't want to be a proselytizer of all things Seattle, but the, 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 Curtis loved this region. All you know, that's why I loved Rainier so much. That's why it was so heartbreaking for him to ultimately spend his last days in a one-room apartment in Beverly Hills with the terrible air of L.A. killing him, literally killing him. He's rediscovered by the Seattle librarian, Nancy Leach, who writes him a series of letters, and he tells his life story to her in his 80s over a course of four, four years and 48 letters. So sad. So I, you know, I really wanted to, having done that now, when I'm looking for a book project, I think two things. Where do I want to be? <laughs> and, you know, what do I want to spend time in? And I love the West, and so this gave me a chance to go to some of the most gorgeous places all over. Um, and who do I want to spend two or three years with? Yeah. You know, you're inhabiting that person, you're living that dream. That said, I'd love to find a book that would take me to Italy again. So. <laughs> and, and so when you, no. were, when you were writing your novel, uh -huh. did, is that when you spent yes, time in Italy exactly, to research exactly, the novel? Exactly yeah. Right, yeah. And are you thinking of, of, of doing another? Well, you're being, doing a good reporter's job of pressing me here, but I'm going to keep it very Oh, oh I see. Desk, okay. Right? No, that's, that's um, <laughs> Not because I don't. No, that, I just have fine. to let it circulate and marinate and, no, no, and no, all that's that stuff. Totally yeah. understandable. Right. Uh, so was Gifford Pancho somebody you were pleased to spend yeah, and Pincho, it's a fabulous story. He was the founder of the Forest Service, and he's in the Big Burn, of course, and a very odd duck. I mean, he, talk about ghosts, his first wife died. He then visits her through psychic readings and, you know, has her, well, we had a great dinner the other night with the president, <laughs> he pulls up a chair with her. Um, he, he was, to me, just this sepia-toned figure, Gifford Pincho, founder of the Forest Service, and to bring him to life was wonderful. Now, Gifford Pincho III, his grandson lives here in Seattle and I met him oh. and I asked him I was a very really nervous because you know it's a full-fleshed portrait to use a euphemism um, that I do of, of Pincho yeah right warts and, uh, all. Warts and all I right, was just gonna right. say right. Yeah. <laughs> and so someone said oh you've got to meet Gifford Pincho the third I, oh, I don't know. so we finally somebody got us together and he came up gave me a warm handshake looks just like Pinch too and um, he said I said well do you think I did justice to your grandfather and he said you know, you made him out to be only slightly more daft than family lore had. <laughs> which, which I really like. Because there's, there's a scene early on in the Big Burn where Pincho and Roosevelt are wrestling. They strip down to their skivvies and do this wrestling at the manly men doing manly things. And it's like how they meet. And they go on to do uh, the founders of American conservation. Right. You don't see that in most of the books on conservation. Oh, no. <laughs> well, Tim, I'm afraid our time is up, but Aww. it's gone so fast. Damn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure.